Welcome to Paul's letter to the Colossians. He's writing from prison. And you just know that in prison, Paul is miserable. He's malnourished. He's probably getting beaten on a regular basis by guards and prisoners. He lives in a dank, dark cell that reeks of rot and feces and vermin. He's probably ill. He's often alone. He's almost entirely cut off from news of the outside world and especially of news about his beloved churches. He could very well be whispering the words that we read in the book of Colossians through the slot in the cell door to Epaphras, whom he names in the beginning, who is writing these words down as Paul whispers them through the door, writing them down to deliver to the church in Colossae and other churches in the area as well. Now, Paul never visited the church in Colossae. He's only heard of it. It's one of those churches that spread out, that was planted from a church where Paul had been, which is could probably be Ephesus or, or Thyatira. Now, one of my favorite passages from all of Paul's writings is Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 through 23. And what I'd like to do today um, is just read it. It's so good. Paul says, Since the day we heard of your faith, we do not cease to pray for you. Of course, when you're in prison, I guess you've got a lot of time to pray. We ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. He has translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, that are in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created through him and for him. Wow. And he is before all things. And in him, all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, that in him, in all things, he may have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him, all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself. In him, things in earth, things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you were once alienated in, in mind and enemies by wicked works. Yet now... He has reconciled you in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable in his sight. If indeed you continue in faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. I now rejoice in my sufferings.
Wow, Paul. <laughs> what I want you to see in this long passage is its center. Jesus, right there in verse 15, he is the visible, tangible icon of the Creator God. And we just saw him crucified on Good Friday. We saw him walk out of the grave on Easter. And if you haven't seen the new series yet called The Chosen, let me recommend it to you as a wonderful portrayal of Jesus and his disciples and the relationships that they share with one another. The Chosen, it's now uh, in season two. So this is Jesus. He is the one, as Paul says, for whom and through whom everything was made. That's verse 16. He's the one who holds everything together. That's verse 17. He's the first one to rise from the dead, which makes him supreme over all. El Supremo. That's verse 18. He's the one in whom God's fullness, his pleroma, resides. Right there in verse 19. He's the one who is bringing everything back into God's orbit. That's verse 20. And Paul is his servant, and he's rotting in a jail cell. Now, you can imagine that it's not much of a leap to wonder from his circumstance in this jail cell how incongruous the reality is. The servant of El Supremo sitting in a jail. How does that work? And then Paul looks out and he Hears that his churches are plagued with factions, with false teaching on the inside, and they're experiencing severe persecution coming in on them from the outside. The grim realities might make a per persuasive case that maybe Jesus isn't so supreme after all. But no, Paul doesn't go there does he? Instead, Paul recognizes the really real grim realities all around him in the churches, and he clings to Jesus in the midst of that, in all his glory. So Paul's not blinding himself to the grim realities with a pie-in-the-sky sort of vision. Scroll it up. And he's not getting lost in the grim realities, despairing of Jesus' majesty. No, he's just praying. You see that in verse 9, where he prays for three things. He prays for knowledge of his will. He's praying for, for wisdom from the Holy Spirit, which translates, in Paul's mind, in Paul's prayer here, into good living. It translates into smart decisions. It translates into fruitfulness in our efforts. That's verse 10. It's so good. Second thing Paul prays for is that we might be strengthened by his might. He's mighty. To patiently endure the grim realities. And that's in verse 11. Because in this dark world, there's just always something that's grim. And you know what, it, what's going on in your life. You know what's going on in my life. Grim realities that we have to deal with. And the third thing that Paul prays for here is giving joyful thanks for who we are and what we have in Christ. Verse 12, an inheritance we have an inheritance in the kingdom of light. So the grim realities that we face are the dominion of darkness that still dominates much of our world. But Paul says, and Paul feels it deeply, that Christ has delivered us from that dominion. He has brought us into this circle of light, even in that dank dungeon cell 
the daily deprivations, the beatings, the isolation, the illness and the anxiety that Paul faced, and whatever else that you might be facing today, this week, next month, this year, in the midst of the grim realities, we pray and endure. We pray and overcome. That's the hope that Paul is presenting in the book of Colossians this week. I hope you enjoy it.